Hi folks, I'm Sarah and I'm a writer and a reader and this is my channel where I talk about independent publishers and the great books that they publish and the craft of fiction and one of my goals for this summer was to read through all of the books that I picked up on a recent spring trip to Two Dollar Radio, which is an independent publisher based in Columbus, Ohio. And I was there in April and I got to visit their bookstore and I picked up five gems, five novels, and I have read four of them. I'm saving one for the fall, but I figured it might be a good time, a good enough time to come and share my thoughts on each of these great books from Two Dollar Radio. Part of the title of this video is The Art of Bristling, and I'm going to get that into that a little bit later in the video, but first I thought I would chat about each of these books in turn before we get to what I mean by The Art of Bristling. But first a little bit about Two Dollar Radio. Two Dollar Radio was founded in 2005 by married couple Eric Obanoff and Eliza Wood Obanoff and they, like I said, are located in Columbus, Ohio, and they also have a bookstore and a vegan cafe. They talk about their, um, their books as being bold works of literary merits, of kind of creating these vibrations that are too loud to ignore, like a good $2 radio would. Um, and so I was really excited to get to finally visit their bookstore and pick up some of their books in person. So first up, we have My Volcano, by John Elizabeth Stinsey. And let's start with the epigraph, actually. So I'm gonna read it here. The epigraph to my, volcania, my volcano is, reality is nothing but the opinion of power, old witch's proverb. This book was my absolute favorite of the bunch and they were all great, uh, but this was my favorite. It blew me away. This book is very weird. It's very funny. It's pretty sad. It's kind of scary. It's really gutsy and it has a lot of hearts. Uh, the author describes it as a little bit queer, a little bit anarchist. I've seen it described as science fiction and eco horror and a parable. It is, uh, it's unique. That is, the, that is the word I would use to describe it. It's brilliant. And the basic premise is that on June 2nd, 2016, a volcano emerges in the middle of Central Park in New York City and begins to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And throughout the summer of 2016, this volcano just keeps getting, getting larger and larger and larger and larger. You can see the structure here, and I'll show a little close up of it. Um, it's broken into these numbered sections. And then in each section, you learn that it's a different day within the summer of 2016 mostly there are some deep dives into the past and a little bit further into the future but it's mostly within 20 the summer of 2016 but not in a linear way we jump forward a few days we jump backward a few days and every time we jump to a new numbered section we are also jumping to the story of a different character so jumping to a different thread of a different character and there are many 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 characters that were jumping back and forth to and from and I think it was Publishers Weekly described it as spinning plates so the author Stincy is able to keep all of these spinning plates moving all at once you have all of these different characters and all of these different events going on and somehow you're able to follow along seamlessly even though the timeline is pretty impossible to follow you are able to follow these really gripping stories of all of the individual characters uh, throughout this summer of 2016. And so we don't only have a volcano appearing in the middle of Central Park, there are all sorts of other crazy things going on too. There is a, um, a nomadic herder in Mongolia who's stung by a bee and is transformed into a bee thistle green thorned creature who starts absorbing the consciousnesses of all of the plant and animal life around him uh, into one single single conscious horde of life of plant and animal life that's that actually then sweeps across all of asia and beyond we have a giant terrifying golem who starts destroying mines and factories and other sites of the destructive nature of capitalism and we have a character one of my favorite characters who 
um, splits into two versions of himself. He has a version of himself that's living in New York City and a version that's living in Hawaii. And uh, once he figures out this is happening, he gives himself a call and starts having conversations with his other self. Uh, we have beams of light appearing in Antarctica, which are maybe alien life forms. I'm not sure. We have these like possibly gods, I'm not sure, called the otherwise, who are kind of um, puppeteers for all of the things going on with humans on, on the planet. Uh, we have llamas that suddenly overtake and invade Machu Picchu and then suddenly disappear and appear in other places across the globe. Uh, and that, I mean, that's not even the beginning of it. We have houses and other structures that suddenly grow legs and start kind of walking around. It's, we have a, a child that is transported 500 years into the past. And somehow you're able to follow each of these things throughout the story. And I've seen this described as, um, in, in a couple of interviews with the author, um, as doomsday capitalism is one way of describing the book because no matter what is going on in terms of the apocalypse, apocalypses that are happening on the globe, um, capitalism still thrives. We have this, this volcano growing out of Central Park and it's covered in billboards. Um, it's destroying New York and the entire region and it is covered in all of these billboards. Um, I've also seen it, the author talks about how a lot of the, the heart of the book is really the personal eruptions that are happening in each of the characters' lives and kind of juxtaposing those against the volcano that's growing in the middle of New York City and all of these other worldwide eruptions and disasters compared with these personal disasters and eruptions that are happening to each of the characters. And I think that's why, because those, those eruptions are so beautifully thought through and written, I think that's what pulls everything together in the end. There also seem to be multiple timelines, either they're parallel universes or they're kind of the world stopping and restarting again. It's not really completely explicit what's going on there. And the title, I love the title, how it plays on this idea of doom, both, doomsday capital, capital, both doomsday capitalism and these ideas of these personal eruptions for the characters. So my volcano, you know, even though the world is ending, I still have my own personal pain and issues to deal with. So this is, this is my volcano. This is what's erupting inside of me. But then also you get this sense of my volcano as in this desire throughout the book, even in an apocalypse, to, to claim it as your own, to buy the apocalypse. And um, you, again, you see that with the billboards on the side of the volcano. It can't be your apocalypse, this is my apocalypse. Or these amazing lemonade commercials throughout the book that use different apocalyptic events to sell lemonade. <laughs> And they're, they're probably my favorite parts um, of the book. So I won't say too much more about them because they're so fun to read. I don't want to spoil them. So this idea of like doomsday capitalism and my volcano, like you can lay claim to the end of the world. Even as the world is ending, you can still lay claim to whatever is left. So somewhere on the cover, this is described as a kaleidoscope. And I don't think there's a more perfect word for this novel. Uh, each of these dated sections, you get these bright, gem-like, colorful shards of stories of each of these characters. And then there's this invisible hand who turns the narrative and everything shifts. And so then as you're watching, it's becoming something that's still familiar, it's still part of the same story, but it's new. And so you, you're surrounded by this beautiful, colorful life, but it always feels a little bit unsteady and a little uncertain because it could shift at any moment. And so I would say that this absolutely is a kaleidoscope of a novel. So who is this book for? So I think you would have to be very comfortable with we, a weird situation, a very weird book if you like you know, devastating situations that are also full of humor. <laughs> I think you would, like I do, um, you might enjoy this book. 
And Stincia actually says, I'm going to read it because it's such a great quote. You will really love this book if you have the opinion that reality is weird. And if you think, like me, that the fact that so many people believe there's even a steady thing that we could call reality is fucking insane. If that's who you are, this book is definitely for you. And so, yeah, like I said, if you like a good laugh along with your devastation, <laughs> you, you definitely will love this book. One final suggestion, um, if you do pick up this book, don't get bogged down in the details and don't try to follow the timeline. I was tempted at one point to try and, and map out the timeline and figure out like, oh, are we, are we, like, are we in parallel universes? Or, you know, I was just trying to figure out, okay, like what, what is going on? Um, and I think that that is not necessary. I think you should just enjoy the ride, enjoy the character's stories, enjoy the weird situations. Just love, let the lava flow over you and enjoy the book. So follow-up reading. Uh, so in one of the interviews that I read that I'll link to below with the rumpus, uh, Stincy was uh, talking about how after the novel was written they were told that uh, it was similar in theme and structure maybe through to, to I'm, let me, I'm gonna pick this up so I don't get this wrong uh, to through the arc of the rainforest by Karen Tay Yamashita which I I should have memorized because I actually have that book and it's published by Coffee House Press um, and I hope to do a Coffee House Press video sometime in the near future but then also an influence was green grass running water by Thomas King so if you're interested in exploring more those are two options for you um, and then about the author, John Elizabeth Stincy, or JES, is a non-binary and trans novelist, poet, visual artist, editor, and teacher who was born and raised on a cattle farm in northwestern Ontario. And they are absolutely br brilliant. I will be keeping an, out, an eye out for their books in the future. I, I cannot tell you how much I loved uh, My Volcano. My, my dad was, I was staying with my parents when I was reading it, and. Um, my dad asked me like, what are you reading? And I tried to describe it and I just like, I can't, I can't even <laughs> describe it. It's just too, too crazy in the best way. Next up is A Door Behind a Door by Yelena Moscovich. And this book, um, we open with Olga, who is a young woman who lives in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she, as a young child, immigrated from the Soviet Union as part of the 1991 Soviet diaspora. And when we meet her now, in the future, now that she's an adult, um, she's kind of struggling to find a job, job, kind of struggling to find her footing. But she has met a wonderful and sexy girlfriend, and they're living together. And things are starting to kind of look up for her. And kind of out of the blue, she gets this phone call from someone from her past, a neighbor that lived in her building when she and her family lived in the Soviet Union, a dangerous neighbor who had stabbed um, their, the old woman who lived upstairs. And his name is Nikki. And Olga gets this call from Nikki and discovers that her brother, Mosh, is in trouble and is missing. And so Olga sets kind of sets out to find and help her brother and descends in the process into this underworld. And by underworld, I mean that in two ways. Um, it's kind of this cri brutal crime underworld of Milwaukee, but also the underworld. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that throughout the novel, we meet several people who are actually dead. So it is, it, she journeys to the actual underworld or somewhere adjacent to the underworld somewhere like the door to the underworld so that is kind of the setup for the story but it's it's not linear there's I, I wouldn't pick this up thinking that there's going to be kind of a strong plot arc it's very fragmented very experimental it's twisty it's dark it's super sexy it is a really really vivid and sensuous and just has a lot of amazing sentences and language so while it doesn't necessarily have a a plot it definitely has a an atmosphere to it in a way this book is about hell or about a journey to hell and it's a very 
melancholy and sensuous kind of a hell and you might even say it's kind of about the hell that we all hold with, or the potential for hellish behavior that we all hold within each of us I would say if you if I was pressed to say like oh, what is this book about um, that's kind of one of the one of the things I came away with and there's a review in the Chicago Review of Books that says that a door with a door behind a door kind of feels like an extended metaphor for the immigrant experience um, and describe, actually kind of describes that experience as something akin to a death come like you're leaving behind the the person and the place that you were in um, and journeying to somewhere new and so I thought that was an interesting note about the book as well um, but even the title a door behind a door is a quote within the book that i'm gonna read here so at one point nikki says to olga uh, to get to hell they take you through america there's a door behind a door um, so yeah that really that i think that invokes the immigrant experience but also kind of america <laughs> <laughs> and, um, maybe what that experience has been for them as immigrants and refugees in America in particular. But the real true star of this novel is the structure and the bold sentences and formatting. So it's all structured around these all capital uh, headings followed by a few sentences or a few paragraphs at most. And the headings are really fantastic. They are, a lot of times they're really funny and um, you know sometimes sad and at the very least interesting. They, they help direct your attention. Um, sometimes the heading is like the name of a character. And so you, you know because of the heading who the paragraph is about or it's a place or it's a concept or it's even like the first sentence of the paragraph it kind of the heading leads in as a sentence into the rest of the section and so there are these little little bursts of um, like vignettes and in an, a, an interview with LA Review of Books um, Moscovich says she was thinking of books um, like novels in verse when she was thinking of the structure and I'm actually going to read another quote um, Moscovich is uh, her interviews are so amazing just even the language she uses in interviews is gorgeous and so i'm gonna link a few below because i think they're really worthwhile checking out I'm just gonna read straight from here um so about the structure she, moscovich says i was thinking of the whole russian heritage of lyricism and its taught liminality between melody and mathematics I was thinking of the way we breathe when we are screaming or crying or swearing or avowing or when we are terrified. I wanted this novel to have such lungs, syntactical lungs, that breathe the text with this level of involvement or subjectivity. I wanted language that takes itself utterly to heart. I thought that was so amazing thinking about this language as having lungs and I could really see that when I looked back to the structure um, that it was like like screaming or like like breathing in and out and in and out uh, the way she has the, the the small sections broken up and then in that same interview she compares the rhythm of the novel novel to a heartbeat and she says the rhythm is not something I established because it cannot be authored I get a feeling for how the text will move it's a sensation something like remembering something like wishing I am remembering or wishing for a heartbeat, like the loneliest lonesome loner being love struck for someone that does not yet exist. I am just smiling reading that because it's so cool. So the effect of this form, it's like it's somehow like both punchy and ethereal. So you get these quick these sentences that are like quick punches to the gut, but then there's a floatiness about all of it somehow. And and for me, it, it somehow takes me back to this idea of the journey to hell. Um, somehow it's it's like we're in this kind of melancholy, misty, mysterious, murky, scary, dark kind of sexy <laughs> place and suddenly you're just hit with a stab of pain or a, a punch in the gut and that's like the effect of the whole novel itself and the structure and the language really 
builds that. And I, I love that in one interview, the author described the journey to hell as her favorite journey. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. Um, but she then goes on to describe the kind of preoccupation with the journey to hell as a particularly, in her words, a particularly Slavic or Russian fascination or preoccupation. And she, in the interview, describes how in a lot of Russian literature, uh, there is uh, this sense that we are all bad. Uh, we all hold this badness within ourselves. And there's no, it kind of has a melancholy sense to it that even, as she says, even within acts of, of love, we still have like in, in the kernel of those acts of love, they could be the purest acts of love, but there's still an element of badness in those pure acts of love because that badness lives within each of us and so we can't escape it. Everything we do will have a kernel of that, that in it. And I thought that was so fascinating, but also really I could then see how that came out in the novel and in the characters themselves. There are several characters who stab other people for seemingly no reason. There's like no, no reason ever given why these multiple characters stab other people. And at the end, I came away with this deep, deep sense of unease uh, because, you know, you're presented with these characters who, you know, some of them are good people and then they just kind of randomly are stabbing these other people. You just get this sense of like, well, if they could just up and stab somebody for no apparent reason, who else might do that? I mean, any, anybody <laughs> could. Um, if that lives within them, could that live within any of us, perhaps? And that's the sense of unease that I came away with after finishing the novel. There's no real closing, definitely ends on a very uncertain and uneasy note, uh, which maybe again brings us back to this idea of hell and it not being something that ends. Um, and in fact, huge, huge spoiler, grammatical spoiler here. Am, am I coining the term grammatical spoiler? I might be. Um, grammatical spoiler, it ends on a comma. The book ends on a comma. Be still my heart. So who is this book for? This book is for anyone who doesn't mind not having kind of a plot or a, a narrative arc in the traditional sense. It's for anyone who likes experimental, fragmented, dark, kind of murky, mysterious, I don't really know what's going on here and I will probably never figure out what's going on here kind of books. Um, if you like leaving a book with a deep sense of uncertainty about what just happened to you in those however many days it took you to read, um, then I think you'll like this. Um, it is, as a novel, it is kind of like a nightmare or a dream. It's a feeling and a rhythm. It's a book that is a feeling and a rhythm. And so if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, then this might be right up your alley. Elena Moskovich is an author who was born in Ukraine and she came to the United States in 1991 as a Jewish refugee. She lives in Paris now. She has two other books, The Natashas and Virtuoso, and uh, I highly recommend seeking her work out. So in terms of follow-up reading, um, in another interview, uh, Moskovich was uh, asked if there were any particular authors who were influences, particularly in the very visceral, embodied details of her work. And she uh, particularly noted Yoko Tawada, who is a Japanese writer who lives in Germany. And her books are published by New Directions. You might have seen them around. I highly suggest checking them out. Um, they're definitely on my list. Um, it, as is New Directions in general, to check out. So if you're looking for something that might give you that similar, really visceral, vivid 
descriptions, um, then maybe Yoko Tawada would be a right match for you. And next we have Not Dark Yet by Barrett Ellingson. And this was pub published in 2015, so a little while ago. But this is about uh, Brandon. And Brandon is a, a photographer and um, a former military sharpshooter, I think, um, who has recently moved to a cabin in the mountains. And his neighbors are um, embarking on a huge project to start planting crops along the mountainside that are now viable in that area because of climate change. And so it's about Brandon's interactions with those neighbors who are becoming farmers now because of climate change. Um, it is also about Brandon wanting to apply to an astronaut program um, to send the first humans to Mars. And Brandon seems to be dealing with a chronic illness and some drama in his love life. And he, we get flashbacks to his past and his childhood and to an incident in a university laboratory where there was an accident with a, a, a lab animal. And so there's all of these kind of different threads involving Brandon and Brandon's life. But at the end of the day, this is really a novel about climate change. This is set in a, the very near future where the lives and the livelihoods of humans are still recognizable. Everything seems fairly the same as it is now, except that the climate change disasters are becoming much, much more frequent. There is much more unrest and protest and displacement and just overall violence and change happening in the world. Um, so while it's recognizable, um, you can definitely tell that this is set in a, in a near future situation. Ellingson makes a lot of really interesting choices with the prose. She goes into, at one level, it is extremely detailed in terms of descriptions, particularly of the interior architectural details of buildings and then the objects that kind of inhabit those buildings. So extremely, extremely detailed descriptions of uh, Brandon's surroundings in any given scene. Um, but then in other situations, there is very little description. So there's a lot about Brandon's past and livelihood that we don't know. There's a lot about Brandon's interior feelings and motivations that we don't know. And um, probably most noticeably, there is a complete um, absence of place, location, names. There's no single city named, no country is named, no region is named, and no, not even a continent is named. So she refers to different continents as the Western com continent and the Eastern continent and the Southern continent and the Northern continent. And that's how places are named within the novel. And it's a little bit jarring to encounter the, that. But as I suspected and was confirmed in an interview that Ellingson did, um, this was really an effort to make sure that the reader came away feeling like this could happen anywhere and indeed is happening everywhere and that no reader could come away and say, oh, I don't need to worry about this stuff that's happening in this place, that, that it feels ambiguous enough that it could be happening and is happening anywhere. And so that was kind of the reason. And it was a really interesting choice that at once was kind of jarring, but in the end I understood completely. But despite that, and oddly, the, I think the strongest element of this book is actually the specificity and the vibrancy of the places themselves. So I can picture vividly the apartment building that Brandon has left in order to go move to the cabin in the mountains. And I can picture that cabin perfectly and the laboratory, the owl room in the laboratory that he spends time in. It's so vividly described um, that I can, I can picture them. And so this is definitely a novel about place and space and how we occupy, occupy those places and spaces and how we as humans change and adapt those places and spaces without regard to the consequences that our changes and adaptations will have 
for other living things and for future generations of humans themselves. And so that's what I took away from this novel. And I think it was a really powerful message. And you could just get, get a feel for um, how strongly Ellingson understands the science behind all of this environmental change. It felt very real. Like this is, it's set in the future, but this is not science fiction. <laughs> this is like reality. Um, this isn't fiction, this is future. While it wasn't the darkest of the books, it was the most frightening to like to your core um, of the books because it is not fiction. It's it's future. It's going to happen. The title, uh, Not Dark Yet, actually comes from a haiku by a Japanese poet from the 18th century. And the poet's name is Yosa Busan. And the, I'm going to read the translation. Not quite dark yet, and the stars shining above the withered fields. Which Ellington explains is about um, letting go of the concept of, of possessions and you can feel it's partly about the kind of the letting go of, of the concept of ownership and um, possessing anything on this earth. And you can feel Brandon doing that throughout the novel. He's letting go, you can just feel him letting go of all of these different elements of his life. And at the same time, all of the people around him are frantically grasping to hold on to things within their worlds. So for example, the neighbors, they are seeing their land change due to climate change and they are doing whatever they can in terms of changing the way they're farming, you know, farming crops that are now viable in that area in order to kind of claim ownership over that land still. And so, you know, with disastrous consequences. So who is this book for? I would say if you're interested in climate fiction, you absolutely should pick this up um, to see how it can be done in a very, very real, it feels so real, um, a very real way. So if you're interested, especially if you're interested in writing climate fiction, um, this might be a good novel to pick up. I will say that I the, the prose style wasn't my preferred style. It was a little formal. It felt a little distant. And I prefer things to be a little bit weirder, either, either weirder or like more intimate um, somehow. So, but the concepts and the story were all really wonderful. And I came away thinking about this novel a lot in the weeks since I've finished it. I've thought about it a lot. Uh, about the author, Barrett Ellingson is a Korean-Norwegian writer and she's written a few other novels. And I think she has a degree in biology and works as a science journalist and you can really see that in this novel that comes through really well. Her expertise in these areas. Follow-up reading, in an interview on Twitter, um, Barrett Ellingson was asked um, if there were any writers that influenced her and she listed Jeff Vandermeer who in fact provided a blurb for this book so um, it seems like there's a strong connection there and then in terms of specifically science writing she listed a poet um, and writer named Tanya Hersman who has a poetry collection called Still Life with Octopus which is, is described as an interrogation of the boundaries between the human and animal worlds so that sounded really fantastic and I looked that up right away and it, it, it looks really good. So I have already discussed New Animal at length in a previous video by Ella Baxter, uh, but New Animal is about a young woman in her late 20s named Amelia Aurelia. She is a cosmetic mortician in her family's funeral home and she is kind of floundering in her life. She spends her evenings surfing dating apps, looking for men to sleep with. And early on in the novel, her mother passes away and Amelia basically unravels from there and she escapes to Tasmania where her father lives and she skips her mother's funeral and she kind of tumbles into this BDSM community that she doesn't understand well enough to interact with in a, in a safe way at all and so she basically continues to unravel from there and hijinks ensue and it's a very sad 
but also very funny novel. And Ella Baxter has a really great quote about Amelia in Bomb magazine that I'm gonna read. She says, grief has a reputation for being heavy and dense, but Amelia's experience of grief is that it is an unbearable lightness. It untethered her instead of anchoring her down. And I thought that was a particularly beautiful description of grief. So who is this book for? So if you really like infuriating characters who make really confusing and self-destructive choices, if you love quirky families and friends, if you love things that combine deep sadness with kind of ridiculous humor, um, then this book might just be for you. Um, it's great. So those are the four books. Let's see if I can get them here. Those are the four books, but we aren't done yet. Uh, part of the title of this uh, this video was the art of bristling and what do i mean by that so there are books that are out there that for whatever reason don't provide a smooth entry into their narrative maybe it's the language maybe it's the structure maybe it's the characters whatever it is it's jarring it, it's bristling it, it kind of riles you up a little bit you don't um you don't smoothly enter into the story and so that's kind of what i'm referring to as as bristling at the beginning of a book and by bristling i mean kind of the definition of when someone um aggressively takes like a defensive attitude against something so like you come to a book and something about it just kind of grates against you and um, it might just be that it, the book is not to your taste it might just not be the book for you. It might be because it's a bad book, um, or maybe it's something else going on. Maybe it's the kind of book where, you know, you're not sure about it at first, but then for some reason you stick with it and then you are hooked. At some point you're hooked and it becomes a really memorable, valuable, nourishing uh, experience of reading this particular book. And that's actually what happened with me with all four of these books. There was something about them each in the beginning that kind of had me bristling, but I stuck with them and found them more satisfying and more gratifying than a lot of other books that I've read. And so I kind of wanted to explore like what is happening here? What, um, what is so valuable? What do I treasure so much about books that I bristle at in the beginning and then stick with and love by the time I get to the end. So let's look at each of these books um, first and kind of why I bristled. So with My Volcano, it was definitely the structure. I was, you know, it opens with kind of this a structure that you're not really use, used to. It's broken into these small sections, each dated on a different date. And it starts with kind of this distant interview with this jogger and it's just, you know, you're like, what's going on? And I kind of was like raising my eyebrows and groaning a little bit, but um, pretty quickly was hooked into it. And um, it was a joy to read um, once, it, once it grabbed me. A Door Behind a Door, it was a similar structural bristling. I saw the headings and the sections and I was like, oh, okay, this isn't gonna have like a nice, you know, lush, uh, you know, character driven, story that um, you know we all love to love um, this is going to be a bit more challenging for me um, to get into and once i did though it was hugely rewarding by the end with new animal it was actually word choice at the beginning and specifically it was um, as he prodded my vagina with his hangnailed finger it was that phrase that literally made me put the book down. I was like, okay, yeah, and I need a break. <laughs> so um, once I got over that, picked it back up, it was, uh, you know, got through that. Um, it was such a valuable joy to read. And then with uh, Not Dark Yet, it was actually a more prolonged experience. It was, um, you know, I just wasn't driving with the, the prose itself, but found that every time I put the book down, um, it, just the atmosphere and the sense of place was really sticking with me and it stuck with me long after I finished the book. Um, so it, it was the kind of the prose style that I was bristling at, but got through and, and had a really valuable experience reading that book. So why is this happening? Maybe it's because we have to work harder to get into the book itself. And you know, something that you work hard at might be more gratifying um, once you are rewarded at the end. Um, so that might be it. Maybe it's, be 
maybe it's because the book disrupts your expectations and so you're, um, you're paying a little bit more attention and so your antenna, antenna are up. You're looking a little more closely. This isn't the kind of novel that you're used to reading and so you're, you're paying more attention and therefore are more available to be like rewarded and to, be, to find interesting things within the book because you're paying more attention because you are reading something you're not used to reading. Maybe it's, maybe it's because you're afraid that um, you aren't gonna like it or you're fearful that you're not going to understand it. That's definitely something I fear in a book. It looks a little more experimental that I'm, I'm not gonna understand it. And so by sticking with it and saying, oh no, I, okay, I understand this, um, it's rewarding. Maybe it's that our entertainment is so polished and kind of maybe like washed out and, it, and it's um, prepared in a way that will be um, appealing to the widest possible audience. And so when we encounter something that's a little bit more raw, um, a little bit different than what we're used to, then, and it's not created to appeal to a super wide audience, it feels kind of harsh at first um, and then when we stick with it we are again rewarded by the end with this incredible piece of art and if we stick over if we stick stick it out over that initial hump of like what is this <laughs> then um, but then in the end we get to enjoy and appreciate something new you know we like routine um, routine is pleasing <laughs> and um, but the, but encountering things that are different are kind of essential to our growth and um, even like roughage like friction is good roughage is good for your diet right so maybe it's good in your fiction too or maybe it's actually the opposite so actually we're all born with this innate drive to pay attention to anything in our surroundings that's new. It's actually this ancient part of our brains uh, called the novelty bias. And for early humans, it, you know, out, you're out in the wild in the forest or on the desert or in a cave or something, and you see something new that you've never seen before, your brain is wired to pay attention to that to determine whether it's a risk or an opportunity. So is it something that's gonna kill you or is it something that you can eat? Um, so our brains are actually already wired to um, be interested and seek out things that are new that um, kind of appear in front of us. And so maybe it's um, this encounter with a new structure, a new form of this, this book that we haven't seen before. And we're just primed as humans to kind of like bristle at first and say, like, what is this? And then once you know what's going on, you can enjoy it. Um, so maybe that's what's going on like the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up, you're bristling, that means there's more surface area to be aware of every breeze and every scent and every movement. Um, you're more attuned to, to experience what's going on around you. And because there's more surface area to absorb the things going on around you because you are paying attention to this thing you've never seen before, then you are absorbing more of the the writing of the language of the narrative um, you're paying closer attention but at the end of the day here's what i think is actually going on i think in a book that you um, or i <laughs> kind of bristle at at the beginning is actually the sign of an author who is starting or trying to start a conversation with you they are setting up a challenge they're saying here's something that i uh, that i want to tell you i want you to pay attention to it Will you engage in this conversation with me? Um, you know, you have books that are just kind of a beautiful narrative, a story being told to you that you can kind of float right into. I love novels like that too. Um, but then you have novels and books that you really feel like you are engaging in a conversation with someone else. And I think at the end of the day, that's what's going on with each of these books. Um, they're being set up in a way that is supposed to be a conversation between the author and the reader. And I think that brings me to $2 radio in general. I think $2 radio itself is, a conver is creating a conversation with all of these books that disrupt expectations and they're very unique. A lot of them are very subversive and so creative 
And so within each one of these books, we have authors who are creating conversations with their readers, but then overall, $2 Radio is creating conversations among their authors, among their books, and with their readers. And I think that is what is so cool about independent presses in general, is that they're small enough that you can feel that community just by reading the books that they're putting out and not even all of their books just a, some of their books you can get a sense of that conversation and you can be part of that conversation um, and so that is why i love independent presses like two dollar radio so um, i'm so grateful so so grateful to have read these four amazing books i can't wait to read the fifth one and beyond even more two dollar radio is always coming out with great books other many many independent presses <laughs> many many um, are producing incredible incredible work and uh, I can't wait to go read now. I'm, my voice is dry, my throat is dry. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. I'm just, my son's gonna walk in the door from summer camp any minute. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have to make dinner. I told him I was gonna make banana bread. I haven't made banana bread. He's gonna kill me. <sighs> okay. Anyway, I think I'm gonna go read a book and I hope you do something similarly amazing. Bye. Thank you.